Hello and welcome to Beachview, our podcast where we talk about random things. Yes, we love random things. So, today we'll be talking about more random things. So I thought we could get into writing and editing because this is something that we both do. So I thought it'd be an interesting topic because we do it in different ways. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) That's... (laughs) Oh my god. That's a canned response. I don't... (laughs) I like it. Okay. Yes. Uh, Yeah, so let's get into this. So, I understand that you do a little bit of writing on the side. Is that right? Sometimes. Yeah. Well, I know I've read some of your writing a long time ago, so... Tell me about the kinds of things that you write. Like, you're into, like, essays or reviews kind of thing, right? Yeah. Critiques. Yeah, that sort of thing. Uh, I don't know. I like watching video essays, as they're called, which is just, you know, you write an essay and then make a video about it. So I like to uh, write them sometimes. And I rarely get around to actually, like, going through with editing for them, but... You know, it's still, yeah. I guess, a hobby, you'd call it, to write them. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So you write them, like, for yourself, like, to do an actual yeah. video essay? Yeah, just to, like, get my thoughts down, like, on the page, you know, and, like, mm-hmm. I don't know. Do you post them anywhere? Not anymore. I used to. I don't think they're up anymore, though. I, I used to post, Where'd like, the so- scripts. Oh, okay. Like, and where do you do that? Because that's something I'm not really familiar with. Like, what forums are there for video oh, oh. So, essays? Well, you, you, know? just, you just put them on YouTube. Like, you know, you script first and then you get whatever okay. footage you're going to use and whatnot. Or make it more like a slideshow if that's your style. And then you, I got you. edit the video together and throw them up on YouTube. Oh, okay. So, YouTube. All right. So... What kinds of topics did you cover? Uh, usually just, like, media analysis and critique and, like, reviews and stuff. I like, you know, after watching something, playing something, stuff like that, thinking about, like, in thinking through the thing I just mm-hmm. experienced. I, I feel like a lot of people do that. It's not, <laughs> not unique. But <laughs> then sometimes I want to, like, you know, just try to get my thoughts down in a more organized manner. So it's like, I, I like yeah. watching these videos, so try my hand at making them. That's cool. So have you ever made an actual video ed- essay? Yeah, I did for, uh, had a class I took where I ended up doing that in college, but I don't know. Most of the time, they, like, I'll write something out, and then it just stays as a draft, and it don't turn it into anything. Yeah. Do you want to, though? It depends. Like, the main issue I run into is that, like, the way I write and the way I talk is so separate, and I'm not great at writing for a conversational style that, like, most video essays go for, so I'll end up writing something that feels a lot more formal and a lot less conversational. So I just sort of get there, and I'm like, oh, this is, this isn't something that would be good to record, and I don't go back and edit it. (laughs) <laughs> it just sits there yeah well i mean it's like a hobby like you said it's something to do that you enjoy so i mean whether you post it or turn it into a video essay or not like you're still doing something you enjoy so yeah you know it's all good it's all productivity right <laughs> i guess <laughs> Well, I um I understand what you mean though about the writing styles cuz I do a ton of writing at work and that's something that like with coworkers or something like that that you have to kind of manage because sometimes you use a different style of writing. So I write stuff like press releases, business types of communication, I write like internal communication, so like It could be, you know, a letter from the CEO to the whole staff or just some kind of, you know, we have a lot of hurricanes here. So, like, we write about, you know, the weather situation, you know, whatever kind of communication needs to go to staff. 
And then, so we write about articles, like health topics and that kind of thing. And the the part that you have to manage is sometimes it's a different writing style. Well, all of those are different writing styles. So when you're communicating to staff, it's definitely, you know, more informal. And then when you do an article, it's like a feature story. So you have to have a different tone to it. And that's something that like, you kind of have to teach people to do. You know, if I hand off an article to somebody, it's like, oh, this is way too stiff, you know, or sometimes we get doctors who write articles and we edit them or health experts who write the articles or blog posts or whatever. And they're way too technical, you know, so you have to like yeah. bring it down to the audience. If you, you know, if you're going to put it in a magazine, like it has to be you know, understandable. And some of these people just, they're writing way too technically. So, I mean, I I think that's the fun part to me is getting in that um, kind of persona where you're, okay, this time I'm writing this or, you know, what would this person say kind of thing. So I think that's the fun part. But it sounds like you don't because you're like, well, I wrote it and I don't want to go back and change it to, to be more conversational right well that's like a really difficult thing to do too because like i don't know it's just like sitting there looking at it and i'm like i don't know how i would change this to be more conversational yeah and i think you get that a lot like people have one style of writing and it's hard to like change it up a little bit Mm -hmm. but i that's the part that i enjoy (laughs) is uh is changing it up so Making it work for whatever audience it's fitting or whatever, you know, whatever publication it's fitting, you know? Yeah. It's the fun part. So you also, so you don't edit those, but you also do other types of editing, right? Well, before we get to that, I was going to ask, do you write anything for okay. the podcast ever? Um, I write notes sometimes. So like I have a little handy dandy notebook. And um, I'll write, like, when we listen to the albums, I'll write down notes about each song. So I'll, like, list each song and then go through, you know, how I felt about it or anything noteworthy to me. You know, I'll write that down. But for the most part, no, I don't write. I don't write for the podcast. Okay, yeah. Do you? So I took notes on the Taylor Swift album because I hadn't listened to that yeah. one before. But I didn't yes. for the other two, because I had listened to them so much. Uh, that, you know, I already knew what songs they were offhand. I didn't need to take notes Yeah, on it. see, and even if I'm familiar with an album, like, I still get confused with song titles and stuff. So I just, every time, I just write it down and, okay, this song, and this is what I thought about it, you know? When you're not listening to it, like, right there, and you're responding to it, like, that's where I'm, like, let me take notes on this, you know? Yeah. Yeah, but for me, with writing for the podcast, I don't ever, like, write down, like, a script or anything I'm gonna, like, read off, but I do, for some topics, take some, like, like, get down an outline just to sort of structure what I'm gonna say ahead of time. Yeah. Like, what I'm thinking about, and then just put that in a more structured form. Yeah, I really, um, should do that. (laughs) And if I had more time during the week, I definitely would, because I think it would be easier conversation there. But um, I kind of just, you know, speak from whatever's in my head, (laughs) you know. So it probably would be better if I wrote down an outline. So I need to start doing that. Well, for me, it depends on the subject. Like, it depends on, you know, what we're talking about. Some things I don't like. I didn't get an outline down for any of the don't hug me, I'm scared ones. Just because I felt like I knew that so well that I could just, you know, go off (laughs) without sitting there and trying to remember what I was going to say or anything. Just let it, you know, the conversation flow naturally. But uh, yeah, I wrote an outline for what's going to be coming. Ah, And you said you're going to take time, but I I finished this like 10 minutes before we started, so. Yeah, (laughs) that's true. Well, I could wake up earlier, you know, (laughs) and like, before our podcast and jot down notes, I just typically don't. It takes me a little while to wake up, you know, so. <laughs> yeah. But I think it would be better because I'll have, like, more of a cohesive train of thought when I'm speaking, but, you know, it's all good. Yeah, I think sometimes that uh, 
less cohesive train of thought, as you put it, is is warranted depending on the subject. Yeah, yeah, and especially because it's a conversation, so, I mean, it's, it just, we kind of feed off of each other, but, but so, okay, so I have another, speaking of writing different things, so my friend, Kate, she's been, like, my best friend since fourth grade, she has been trying to get me to do a blog for, like, the past, like, six years, she's like, Jen, you need to do a blog, like, you, you know, you need to write about your travels and you need to like market that and you can write articles and, you know, send them to publications and people will purchase them and like, you know, all this kind of stuff. And then she's like, then you can write off like some of your travel expenses, <laughs> your taxes. And like, she is pushing me to do this. And she has, been, and she always has to give her props because she is one who like pushes me in a good way. Like, you know, I wanted to start grad school after I graduated from LSU. And I took two years off because I was just like, oh, man, like, I'm not ready to go back. And she's like, no, Jen, we're going back. And we started back at the same time. You know, so she really pushes me a lot. And um, in fact, like, she found me this job that I have now. And I've been there for 12 years now. I really love it. And she like made me apply for this job. So (laughs) she's great at that. But I've been hesitant about getting into the blogosphere (laughs) because i just feel like there's so many out there already how i mean what do you think Uh, i mean if you know if it's a hobby you'd enjoy i'd say go for it i don't know much about like blogging these days like yeah my knowledge of blogging comes from people talking about what it used to be like 15 years ago yeah so Yeah, I think now it's more podcasting, you know, so... Yeah, and social media stuff. Like, a lot of what blogs were kind of got eaten up by social media. Yeah, and I'm kind of just like, it's so oversaturated. Like, there's so many travel blogs or podcasts, and it's like, where would I fit in? You know, where would I have a, a niche to kind of explore, so... I'm just like, I don't know. And then, you know, once you're doing something as a, like, quote, job, it doesn't really, it's not really fun anymore, you know? So, in fact, like, I write, I have a travel journal that I bring with me every time we go on a trip. And so I I can remember our trips because I have the worst memory. So every time we go on a trip, I start writing in it, and I never finish writing about (laughs) the trip. (laughs) So it's always these, like, half entries about, like, well, today we did this and this, and then, like, I don't ever write in it, you know, like, I never finish out the trip with it, so it's kind of goofy. I'm going, like, I don't know if this is really, like, <laughs> like, if I have it in me to actually finish anything that I would fully publish online, you know, about a trip, like, because to me, I just want to enjoy the traveling and just be present in what I'm doing, you know? Yeah, is that a, like, physical journal, or is it, like, a, like, you type it up? Yeah. It's no, it's a physical, oh, yes, it's like, you know, old school, like, moleskin little journal, and I have, like, my little felt tip pens that I write in, and so, I like, I love doing it, and I bring it with me everywhere. I, I am always afraid it's gonna, like, get lost, and I'm gonna lose my whole yeah. travel log, but, um, so that's the, the bad part of having, like, an actual journal, but I don't know, it's fun, it's fun to do, but again, I never finish, so... Like, we went to Africa um, in 2019, and that's like, my dream trip. And I didn't even finish writing in it for that trip. <laughs> I, like, thought for sure. Like, I'm going to get everything down. I want to remember this forever. And then, like, I never finished. So, I mean, it's it's a sickness, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you said it's physical, so, like, I, I can't remember the last time I wrote more than a few words at a time. Like, with an actual, like, pen and paper. I I wouldn't be able to finish it either. Right, and maybe that's my problem. Maybe I need to go digital, but I love, I don't know, I'm such like a book nerd, and I love notebooks, like small notebooks. I have like so many just like blank notebooks. Like when we travel, I'll buy little notebooks, and like what am I using these for? I have no idea. They're just blank. I don't do anything with them. I don't understand (laughs) why I buy them. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a problem. It's the idea, I guess. 
It's like the aesthetic. Like, yeah, I bought um, these three little notebooks in um, Venice, Italy. I have to differentiate Venice, Italy, because there's the Venice, Louisiana, and uh, that always is stuck in my head, but probably nobody else (laughs) knows about Venice, Louisiana. But but I bought these little notebooks in Venice, and I intended to use them as, like, Italian journals, like, journal in Italian, and that helps your language learning. And that was probably, like, four years ago, and I have never written in them once. (laughs) They're just sitting in my library. It's like, it's like the whole aesthetic of them that I like. Yeah, it's pretty funny. So anyway, I kind of got a, a little bit off topic there, but well, that's still um, writing. My whole <laughs> yeah, it's still writing. So I do journal every once in a while, like like physically journal, not just for traveling, but like if I am really stressed out, like I'll just you know write a journal entry, like uh, you know, just a kind of a vomiting of thoughts there. But not real, you know. I don't really, I don't really go back and read it or anything. I just like let it all out. But that's really only every once in a while. And oh, I always wonder, like, you know, what do you do with a journal after you write in it? Like, do you just keep it? Do yeah. you go back and read it? I guess do you when burn you're, it. Well, uh, any of those. I guess when you're significantly yeah. older, you know, you can remember something about like twenty years ago and stuff. Yeah, but it's all, like, the only time I write in a journal is if I'm, like, really stressed out. So, like, if somebody was reading this, like, 30 years, they'd be like, (laughs) wow, like, that girl had a tough life, you know? (laughs) It's, like, it's all the bad stuff, like, oh, my God, my cat died, you know? Like, it's the whole thing, so it's only the bad stuff that I write about, so it's really funny, but I'm probably going to just, like, throw it away. (laughs) Maybe somebody will find it. And be like, this poor girl, her cat died. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so yeah, so I don't know about this whole blogging thing. I don't know if it's something I want to get into or or just, you know, write articles. And if you wrote travel articles, like who would purchase them? Like who, you know? It's like you you have to have this insane level to get onto Condé Nast or any of the big travel sites, you know? So... I don't even know what you would do with them. Oh, you gotta start somewhere, as they say. I guess. Yeah, that's like my limitation there. But writing is one of those things that, like, people always ask me to help them with. So, I do it a lot, but, um, I don't do it for any, you know, mostly for work, not for pleasure. So, there you go. Well, (laughs) uh, you wanted to talk about editing (laughs) next? Yeah, yeah, I wanted to, um... Because I know we both do some editing, so I wanted to get into, like, the different types of editing that we do. So we know already that you don't really go back and edit your scripting (laughs) that you write, but you do edit this podcast every week. Yes. Yeah, so tell me how that goes. I I don't even know where to start. I don't know. I... (laughs) (laughs) Uh... Like, what do you have to do when you have, like, we both record different audio files, and then I send mine to you, and then you just work your magic, yeah. and they just so appear. I, I put them in the <laughs> same file, I use my uh, audio editing program, and then I go through, I do a noise reduction pass to get rid of, like, room noise and stuff, and listen back to it, and basically just cut out any, like, stray sounds, or, like occasionally tiny bits of conversation or try to make like Mm -hmm. something a bit more snappy in edit like take out some ums and stuff like that okay yeah Hmm. i don't know i'm still really cool i'm still like an amateur when it comes to editing stuff i know like how to put together like this podcast but i don't know like a ton beyond that well i think you do a good job because it sounds good to me so (laughs) (laughs) it's more than i can do I tried editing some audio once at work, this, like, video, and I was just so, to me, it doesn't come naturally, and I was just so, like, um, not doing a good job. It was, like, choppy, and I was like, okay, somebody else needs to do this. (laughs) This is not my forte, (laughs) so, (laughs) yeah, I think it's harder than it sounds, so I think you do a great job, (laughs) so thank you for doing that every week. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. So, uh, what do you want to yeah. talk about with editing? <laughs> so, again, I do a ton of editing at work, and that's 
anything that anybody writes or even anyone who makes, you know, we get people who do these like random flyers and they send them through us to make them better. So I do a lot, a lot, a lot of editing. And it's always surprising to me that, you know, some people really write well and some people don't. Some people don't really know how to design a flyer with the right words, you know, or signs are a big thing. We do signs all over the place. And so anything that is communication like comes through me and I like to edit it. Like editing is one of my favorite things just because it's something that I'm good at and I'm really good at like catching these little things, you know? So anyway, I feel like that's a fun, I don't know if you say it was fun, but <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing that I do at work. And at home, I just started editing a novel. So I actually reached out to one of my friends from high school because I know that she um, has written a couple of books that she self-published online. And so I was asking her, just kind of curious, like, hey, so do self-publishers, do they edit their work? Like, do they go use an editor or like, you know, how does the whole self-publishing process work? And so I was just having this like conversation with her and, you know, we were messaging each other like on Facebook and she's like, oh, what are you publishing? Are you writing something? And I'm like, no, girl, <laughs> I'm not writing. I'm not writing a novel. I am um, just curious about the whole process. I was like, I might want to get into like editing these self-published novels because I have found like I've read a few self-published books. And they're really good, but, like, they can definitely use some finessing. I find, like, just really common, like, small grammatical ed errors or consistency errors, you know. And I was just wondering, like, do the self-publishers actually go through editing? And so she was telling me, like, she just sends it to a couple of friends who also, you know, that she's made in the publishing world. And... They'll give her suggestions and that kind of stuff, but it's never like a line by line editing process. So I was like, oh, okay, that's interesting. Like it might be something I want to get into just on the side, you know? And um, so a couple of days later, like a week later, she messaged me and she's like, hey, I want to ask you something. You know, do you want to edit my next book? Like it's ready for editing. And I was like, yeah, girl, that'd be awesome. <laughs> so. So I started editing her um, novel. It's really a um, novella length. It's not necessarily a full novel length, but I'm about halfway through it now and I'm really enjoying it. So, which is funny because it's work, you know, but um, it's just like you're reading and I read every night anyway. I read fiction. So this one that she wrote is like a romance novel that is like a continuation from the characters that she wrote from her first one that I, I read probably like a year ago so to me it's fun because when I'm reading through novels I pick out the errors anyway like as I'm reading like oh they missed that one you know so it's like I'm actually getting to correct them so we'll see if this goes anywhere but I don't know I found it to be like an interesting you know thing to do at night like when Travis my husband is sleeping I can just sit there and like edit a novel <laughs> and it's, it's actually enjoyable to me. So I might continue it. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't have anything to add. Do you have anything else or do you want to go to our next topic? <laughs> no. Uh, let's go to the next topic. All right. Well, we actually for once have a second topic that ties into our first. <laughs> Yeah. Rare occurrence on this podcast, but uh, since we mentioned editing, <laughs> I thought I would bring up that Audacity, the program I use to edit this podcast, recently got embroiled in a controversy. Ooh, intriguing. <laughs> Tell me about it. So, this requires a bit of preamble, like most of the stuff I talk about, I guess. <laughs> I feel like I've done quite a few preambles. I like them, yeah. So, Audacity is an example of free and open source software. Have you ever heard of that before? Yes. Okay. What do, what do you know about it? Um, really the only thing that I know about it is, so I know like I have an Android phone and everybody makes fun of me for it, but I love it. But I know that like a lot of the apps and stuff on here are open source, which means that the security is maybe not as robust as 
closed source things. And also when we were redesigning our website at work, like we made sure that we had like an open source platform so that if we did want to go with a different vendor later on, we could like move the whole thing to a different vendor. So that's basically my <laughs> limited knowledge of that. All right. Well, so the free part should be pretty obvious. It means it's free. You can just go yeah. download a program and get it. You don't pay for it. And open source means that the code is freely available to view and edit, which might be why mm -hmm. it could be like a security issue potentially. Yeah. But it can also be like, that can also be a benefit to it is that like, you know, you can look at the code and determine like if you know what you're looking at, you know, this is a potential security issue. Mm -hmm. and we, can, You know, you can go in and fix that. That's one of the things about open source is that you can change it. You can make your own version. You can like just personally or like upload it and other people can use, you know, different versions that they've made of the software. Okay. And, you know, this encourages a lot of volunteers to work on it. And there's a whole culture around free and open source software and you know because a lot of That's people cool. like either they like it as a hobby or you know they think there should be a free program for this or there's an already existing free program that they want to work on like you know as just part of i like this program i'm gonna go work on it a bit yeah that's kind of cool yeah and there's also the ideological like component to it a lot of people like the idea of free open source ideologically like either they want software to be free or they want to have maintain more control over their programs and they might not get that from a closed source program i've seen some arguments that because it's digital it should be free and open source like that because you can basically infinitely copy any digital files that like that's the nature of the technology that's how this uh, the stuff we make with it should be yeah i agree with that yeah some argue that it creates better programs because you can get a lot of people in on it to volunteer time for it and that like you know you can get a lot of different perspectives on it and yeah you can get a uh, like you know a lot of work done on it that and take it in directions that maybe a company wouldn't i totally agree with that i think anytime you have that kind of collaboration where a bunch of different perspectives are coming together it's, it's going to make a better product yeah and i figured i'd get into some advantages and disadvantages of it. You know, the first advantage is it's free. So that's a pretty big yeah. plus. If you're looking for a program or something, it's hard to beat free. Absolutely. For someone like me, like, I refuse to pay for anything online. <laughs> I look for everything free. <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and you can, uh, like, make changes or use other changes if you wish. That's, like, part of the good thing about open source, you know, like, if something about the uh, program you don't like, you can change it or look up to see what other people have done to it to make their own version. That's really cool. Like, I don't think I would have, like, the, the technical uh, capacity right. to do that. But for people who know people who know how to do that, like, probably you, <laughs> I think that's a really cool concept. Yeah. So, and some people, like, because you, you can look at the uh, code, so you can know exactly what it does. There's no worry about, like, if this has any potential things you don't like in it, which uh, will come up in a second when we get to the controversy, so I'll keep that one in mind. Ooh, okay. Right, and some people, right. like I mentioned, like that it's uh, community-oriented. There's a community around it, you can get a lot of, like, different volunteers on it, and it's, because it's free, you know, a lot of people just work on it because they love doing it, which can be an advantage, it can also cause problems, but some people like that aspect of it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, so some disadvantages. Have you ever used uh, any that you know of that's free open source? Um, not editing software or anything like that, but maybe I know I have like some apps on my phone that are probably, you know, like open source. But, um, you know, like any anytime I've tried editing that this kind of stuff, I've used um, like something probably in the Adobe suite since I had that you know, already on my computer at work, yeah. you know? Hmm. Yeah, well, because uh, one of the disadvantages can be they're sometimes worse than paid alternatives. Yes, I have noticed that with certain apps and stuff. Like, it's, it's like, oh, man, like, this is... Or there's, like, tons of bug fixes, so you constantly have to, like, update yeah. it. Do you have... Is that an issue? It can be. that A lot of 
Yeah. You know, because you get a lot of different people working on it. They'll see, oh, hey, there's this bug. Let me go see if I can fix it. And then they'll upload that. And then you, you yeah. can get a lot of different incremental versions. Interesting. I never thought about it that way because it's open source and so many people work on it. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm getting a new perspective they on They usually this. offer, like, a, an experimental build and, like, the full release. And the full release is usually, like, a yearly thing or something and the experimental is just whenever people work on it they put it up and you can like go for the experimental if you want new features or bug fixes or you can just wait till it's like you know the marketed like here's a new stable release i got you yeah but cool. you know because it's often a hobbyist activity it can lack full-time workers some do from like donations but you know they're not making money off of it so they don't have as much capacity to pay people to do that as their normal job Right. That makes sense. Yeah, and as a result, you can sometimes get them, like, they they usually work pretty well, but they might be lacking features or be less powerful or not as well designed as paid alternatives. Yeah. But again, I mean, it's it's free, yeah. so can't really... <laughs> it's hard to complain. It's just, if you're, like, a professional, you might want to upgrade or something, you know, it can be a yeah, situation like yeah. that. Definitely. As an example, I've used OpenOffice, which is an old Microsoft Office alternative. My laptop didn't come with Office mm -hmm. back in the day, so I downloaded this free one. And it got the job done, you know, writing essays in high school. But it wasn't as good as Microsoft sure. Office. It was missing a lot of features and didn't look as good. Oh, uh, I got you. Wow, yeah. I just use actually a free version of Photoshop because... I was home, it was like a long weekend or something, I don't remember, but I was trying to get these signs uh, designed for this golf tournament that I was coordinating, and I was like, oh no, what am I going to do? I have my laptop, but I don't have like Photoshop or Illustrator or any, any of my regular programs that I use for design stuff, so actually I think your mom told me about this free like Photoshop one, and it, like I said, like you said, it got the job done, but it was a little more, um, you know, didn't have all of the functions yeah. that it normally would. Yeah. And another example, which involves the program I use to edit this that we're talking about, Audacity, looks kind of ugly. Like, it's got a very functional design, you know, UI yeah. and stuff, but it definitely feels like a team of, like, programmers put it together, like, code yeah. first, <laughs> and then when they got to the visual design part, they're just kind of like, I don't know, throw something together. Yeah. <laughs> I know what you mean. I've seen stuff like that. Yeah. And a paid <laughs> like funny. audio editing software, for example, like if you were going to make a new one of those in your company, you'd probably start with a graphic design team. And that isn't necessarily the case for open source stuff. And you can get problems where like, you know, it's been this way for so long, it's hard to change. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. So the design aesthetic is not there. Yeah. And yeah. and that can cause, like, you know, it, it can be easier to work with certain things just because the menus are laid out better or, you know, it's easier to read when you're in the process of going through stuff. Yeah, definitely. Sometimes those are not as intuitive to use, so you're kind of, like, searching for, okay, how do I do this, you know? Whereas if it's designed properly, it's usually much easier to figure out where to go. Yeah. So, do you have any else you want to say about uh free open source stuff no but what is the big controversy here yeah the controversy audacity has been you know free for years managed by i think a non-profit team i don't know the exact of uh, this Ooh. but recently like this year got bought out by a for-profit company so they own the rights to it they are maintaining it as free and open source but a lot of people were nervous by this like because you know, or they didn't like it because th there's a whole community behind this and they're very adamant about maintaining the, like, free and open source part of it. And they don't like, you know, some yeah. company's going to buy this and they're going to make changes. They're going to start trying to, you know, just speculating on what could happen, like what could go wrong from this. Ooh, interesting. So when did this happen? This year. I don't know the exact date. Oh. But yeah, it's really recent. And then the okay. main topic for this is, so within, like, this month, I believe, like, it's not been very long, 
they changed their privacy policy for new updates going forward. And this involves, uh, like a statement, uh, we reserve the right to collect data from users, which is a mm. new change. You know, previously it's been free to download and they didn't do anything like that. And while this is a fairly common practice on a lot of apps and websites nowadays, a lot of people in the uh, free open source community hate data collection and were really upset by this change. So, like, you saw a lot of stuff on the internet about, yeah. like, hey, Audacity's doing this, and including some, like, sort of, like, sky is falling, you should delete this program, it's bad now, sort of stuff. Right. <laughs> Yes, I see that all the time, like on social media apps. Um, but that is a a big, big, big deal to people. So how do you think this is going to affect them? Well, so the the main thing people are saying, some people are saying either go, like try to find a new program. But a lot of people are saying, you know, the older versions of this program are still are still available, and a lot of people still like use them, still haven't downloaded and this new update involves the newer versions since the uh, Audacity got bought out. So people are saying, just use the older versions, or because it's open source, you know, people can make their own version without the, you know, new stuff added that they don't like. Ah, uh, I didn't think about that. So they can use an older version that doesn't have the data collection. Yeah, or just, like, take a newer version and then it's called forking, you know, like a fork in the road and fork off Forking. their own, like, oh. version that doesn't have the data collection. Okay, that is interesting. I did not know you could do that. I just thought, like, you know, once they set this up, like, that was it. But, well, yeah, I guess if it's open source yeah. and free, yeah. you can go back and, yeah. That's because it's open source. Huh. If uh, another program that's not open source, uh, you were to change something like this, you wouldn't have any recourse like that. Wow. So do they say, and I know most websites don't, but do they say what they intend to use the data for? Like, why are they doing this? I didn't look entirely. You know, most of their, like, privacy policy is in, like, legalese language. It's very, like, yes. we reserve the right to do this. You know, it mentioned, like, oh, in case we need to cooperate with law enforcement. But I think it's more like, you know, we're going to collect data and we're changing our privacy policy to reflect that we reserve the right to do this. And a lot of people were thinking, you know, the typical mm -hmm. thing, they're going to get it and then sell it as a way to make money. Right. Which is a way to keep it free, <laughs> right? Yeah. Wow. See, this is a problem because, well, there's, obviously this is a big controversy because it always is when it comes to data collection, but... As a person who, like, we do marketing at work, okay, so some of it involves, like, uh, digital buys that uses data to target, you know, people that we want in our select audience to see ads. So on one hand, like, I'm using it at work, it's a little creepy to me <laughs> because, like, this ad can follow you around on whatever website you're on, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, like, really to me, kind of intrusive, but it's good as an advertiser, like, to get your message out there, right? So that's one side of it. The other side of it is every single blog, uh, web page, social media, like, everything you go to, like, collects your data. And so it's, it's just kind of like, what do you do? I mean, like, you don't have any recourse, like, you can't, stop them from collecting your data like if you want to be online at all like how do you get around that um for some things you run programs that block the things that like like trackers in particular that block things that try to like keep track of where you are on the internet some browsers have settings that like yeah. will send a request to not be tracked but that's not like a guarantee but if you're talking about like social media and yeah. accounts and stuff you basically like they allow you to turn off some stuff and like you can turn off say targeted advertising through yeah. google or something but a lot of things you might not be able to do anything about yeah so it's kind of like does that matter i mean people who use audacity like in a way does it matter because you're already giving up all of your information other places i mean maybe some people aren't but you know, how do you feel about that part of it? It's kind of like, to me, it's almost inevitable, like, 
all these companies know what I'm doing anyway, you know? Yeah, well... And it's not like I'm doing anything that's crazy, like, state secrets that can't be shared, you know? So, like, I, I just am kind of going, from my perspective, I'm like, oh, whatever, another company collecting my data, you know? So, how do you feel about that? I, I kind of two minds, because I feel like some people were, when this came out, uh, a bit too, like, panicky about it. Panicky's maybe not the right word, but... Yeah. Because this is pretty common. I don't think it's a good practice, but... You know, and a lot of people are like, you need to delete this program right now. It's spying on you. And it's like, well, it's not anything more than what other things are doing. And while that's bad, it's not like the end of the world. But also like part of it's that it was not like this before and it gets new management. Now it's got this uh, data collection aspect. And a lot of people like didn't like that because it's a change that was just like sprung on to people without warning and like i said people in the free open source community hate this sort of thing they're usually pretty tech savvy even if they don't know how to like code themselves if they're like at all aware of this they're you know like free open source stuff they're usually against this sort of thing which part of the reason why you would use these sort of softwares is because they might not have the tracking and data collection aspects so it kind of like interesting it's kind of a betrayal of that idea to a lot of people yeah i mean it kind of is i don't know are you gonna keep using it or are you gonna yeah use well I, I never version? updated like, it you... to the uh, newer version so <laughs> ah there you go if it's getting the job done why mess with it you know yeah that's crazy though but that that's a big deal um all across you know the interwebs of uh, <laughs> like people just tracking every little thing that you do and it's so crazy and even you know when you're making a purchase like at a store you know every little thing is tracked anything on your smartphone you know is tracked and it's just kind of like you know I, I have um what do you call them the echo and the echo dot like in my house and then People are like, you know, those things listen to you. And I'm like, okay, like, what are they going to hear? Me making a grocery list? Like, why Uh, do I care? You know, (laughs) like, I don't care. I don't know. You know, like, I have nothing. Like, what am I doing? I mean, well, and it's funny because, like, I never, um, John actually got us our Echo. And at first, like, when he asked us about it, we were like, I don't think we would use it. And now we, like, use it constantly or, like, setting timers, like, what time is it? Play a song. You know, it's like we, constantly use it but i'm going like i mean i don't care if it listens to me like really they're gonna hear my conversation about it's data a, collection a, i'm probably being yeah, tagged right private now <laughs> conversation though you know i don't i don't want people listening in on everything i say day to day or like yeah you know if you get in an argument with someone that's over or something or like you're singing to yourself yeah uh yeah i'm like i don't care man like i guess i'm in open source (laughs) Uh but yeah you know (laughs) that was rough but (laughs) but it doesn't really make a difference to me because I'm kind of like I'm not talking about anything sensitive you know so I mean I don't know even if you get an argument like okay like somebody's gonna know I argued I, I don't know it doesn't really bother me but I'm the kind who's like you know what I don't know enough about like how to stop tracking you know so i'm kind of like oh whatever it's happening (laughs) like every time i use my debit card i'm being tracked anyway you know so that kind that's the attitude i have and but i don't i'm not really dabbling into you know free open source coding or using the product you know so i guess it's a different world but um i do feel like it is very intrusive so i guess i have this the same like you said kind of two different trains of thought there but wow that that's a really bold move by these people because you're taking a whole community and you're kind of like inserting a bomb there you know yeah <laughs> like yeah. hey by the way yeah you're all you know a community around this product and now we're changing it all so i think they might lose some people there yeah there was a big like i said a lot of discussion about this a lot of people were upset yeah Oh, that is so interesting, though, like, how this works, and... Yeah. I don't know. It's a cool... It's a cool topic for me. I just think, like, 
like I said, on one hand, I'm using this to advertise to people at work. And on the other hand, I'm like, no, leave me alone. Stop collecting my data. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know. That's It's a conundrum for sure. So an interesting wrinkle to all this is that, you know, due to legal protection for children for tracking stuff, there's a lot of restrictions on how exactly collecting data can happen on people under 13. So, oh. uh, as a result, part of this privacy policy update included a line that basically, like, uh, this program isn't intended for use for people under 13. If you're under 13, don't use it. What? Yeah, which presents uh, another problem, because apparently, and I didn't know this beforehand, but apparently a lot of schools use Audacity to, like, you know, for the uh, kids to teach, I guess, audio editing, or to, like, hey, this is a thing you can do if you want, I guess. I don't yeah. Know. Wow. Right, and so now they now might not saying, be able to do that it. because of this new update. Aw, that's terrible. So, I mean, I know, like, they put that legal disclaimer in, but then... Like, what are these schools going to do? And you know what? I'm kind of going, if there's somebody under 13 who wants to use this, like, no, that's ridiculous. Like, they should be able to use what they want to use. It's free, open source. Like, why? Yeah. You know, I don't know. I feel like that is a wrinkle and they're making a mistake here. <laughs> that's terrible. Like, I know if I was 12 years old and I was trying to use this, I would be so upset. <laughs> <laughs> like, how right. dare you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, the, like, wow. schools and stuff can use the older version, but, you know, they might not know That's that. Good. They might just know about, like, Audacity as a thing if they want to, like, do audio yeah. program, like, audio editing. And, you know, they might look, okay, let me look this up, and they get to the new version, it's like, hey, uh, kids can't use this. And they'll, I guess, be out of luck yeah. or have to try to buy Adobe or something? I don't know. See, that kind of, like, negates the whole premise of this being a free open source program like this is a program that you know you want to share with people online you want them to use it you want them to enjoy using it and then all of a sudden you're putting these restrictions on it and i just i don't know i don't think that's right yeah and that was another thing people were upset about was that you know it that is a restriction of the sort of philosophy of free and open source yeah, exactly. Oh, I hate when people do that. It's like you take something that's working well and that people are, you know, using and being productive with it. And then all of a sudden it's like, uh, plot twist. Like you're throwing something in there and it goes against the whole philosophy of it. I don't like it. Nope. Sold <laughs> me on it <laughs> with that one part because I'm like, you know what? No, like, Kids can use stuff too, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. I don't know. That's like a sensitive point for me. Like, you know, who are you to say who can and can't use this if it's free and open source, you know? Right. Well, it's it's a legal protection thing. They're not yeah. legally yeah. allowed to collect data on kids like that. Right. So. Yeah. I mean, I get that part, but it's it's like because you're now doing this, you are now restricting your audience. And I don't think right. that's right because kids especially need free open source stuff because you know they may not have you know income or the ability to pay for programs but they still want to create right and that's that's a big thing for schools because you know if you're a, yes yeah a school that doesn't have a lot of funding to buy an audio program or something you can use or previously could use this free version if you were having a class that you wanted to teach on audio editing or something yeah no, I totally get that part, and I definitely, that, because before I was like, uh, you know, everything, like you're saying, everything's kind of going that way, but when you're talking about this, you know, legal restriction here, I don't, I don't think that's right. <laughs> uh, that totally changes it for me. Yeah, and, and to me, like, you know, this is probably an issue for people who aren't aware of this sort of thing, but to me it was like, well, this sort of, uh, it sucks, but I can just keep using the old version and be fine. Yeah. But yeah, yeah that does add, uh, you know, bigger issues to it, the under-13 thing. It definitely does. And it makes you think, like, well, what is the purpose? Why are they doing this? What to make money, presumably. For? Yeah, which is terrible. I mean, but, you know, sometimes it's business. You gotta make money, you know? 
Right, which is why, again, why people were, you know, nervous or not happy about the Audacity getting bought out by a private company like that. Yeah, definitely. I can see that controversy. Ooh, interesting stuff, man. All right, well, anything else to add on this topic? Nope, that's all I got. All right, well, um, yeah, I guess my closing thoughts are data collection bad, but some people I think were making a (laughs) bigger deal of it than it needed to be. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but. Well, you know, it's not super doomsday. Like you said, it's kind of like you could still use it. You can use the older version. So I agree. I think, uh, what is it? Chicken little, the sky is falling kind of mentality. Just isn't really, you know, calm down, sir, <laughs> or ma'am. <laughs> yeah, well... Like, calm down, <laughs> yeah. Because cause I know some people are just saying, like, hey, this is a thing that's happening, it sucks, but, you know, be aware of it. And some people are like, oh, no, you need to delete this program now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, what? and again, there's really nothing you could do about it, because that's what the company decided to do. But, yeah, I agree with you. It's, it is what it is, you can't change it. There are solutions to the problem, so yeah, I get it. I mean, I do think Audacity is stupid for moving in this direction, but again, like you said, it's probably to make money, so I guess you can't fault a company for trying to make money, so, (laughs) you know? Yeah, I guess you could fault uh, the team for selling it in the first place. I don't know the situation there, though, so. Yeah, a bunch of sellouts. No, I'm just (laughs) kidding. I don't really know, but... (laughs) But anyway, all right, well, I guess I'll wrap us up, huh? Yeah. All right, well, thank you for listening to the Beachview podcast today. We hope you join us next time, and we hope you got a lot out of this conversation, because I know I did. All right, bye. Bye. Bye.